Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 27th, 2016, and my guest is Terry Moe, the William Bennett Monroe Professor of Political Science at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, where we are recording this in the studios of the basement. He has written extensively on public bureaucracy, the presidency. His latest book is Relic, How Our Constitution Undermines Effective Government and Why We Need a More Powerful Presidency. Terry, welcome to Econ Talk. Great to be with you. So let's start with what's wrong with the Constitution. A lot of us, myself, I'd have to say, would be in this group, think it's a pretty great thing. Uh Uh, You're kind (laughs) of like treading on sacred ground here with, I don't know, pitchfork? I don't know what you want to call it. Well, in a way, that's that's the point. Uh, It is sacred ground, and it shouldn't be. You know, I I, I think there's uh, a lot uh, in the Constitution uh, to be admired and protected uh, and continued. Right? I mean, uh, William Howell and I are big supporters of the Constitution. That's your uh, co-author, I should have mentioned. Yes, Thank you. right. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, we think it's very important for people to look at the Constitution objectively and ask, how does it affect governance today? You know, it was written uh, a little over 225 years ago uh, by founders who had no idea uh, about the problems that we would be facing today and the kind of government that we would need to be responsive in an effective way to those problems. And so they designed a government for their times, for the late 1700s, uh, for a nation of 4 million people, 700,000 of whom were slaves. Of the free people, 95% were farmers. Right? They, this was a time when government wasn't expected to do much, and the founders designed a government uh, of separation of powers with a parochial Congress at its center that couldn't do much. And, you know, that may have been fine for the late 1700s, but it's not fine for today when we're just awash in problems that need to be dealt with. You're also very critical of the founders' attitudes, and you suggest, as others have, that perhaps the Constitution isn't the reflection of what would make the best government, but what would make the best government for people like them aristocratic, slaveholder, wealthy, elite folk. Do you want to push on that a little bit? Well, you know, there are many different uh, forces that went into the design of the Constitution, you know, but a big part of it was their fear of tyranny of the majority. Uh, These were essentially aristocrats. Uh, They they were propertied uh, people who had a lot to protect, and they did not believe that all men are created equal. Right? This was a nation that had talk. many hundreds of thousands of slaves, for one. Women couldn't vote for another. So uh, they didn't believe that uh, everyone was equal in, in any sense. They, they, they believed that they and people like them should continue to control their government. And so what they meant by democracy is very different from what we mean by it today and uh, how responsive we expect government to be to the needs and concerns of ordinary people. I'm a little ashamed to admit that uh, when I read your book, one of the things I learned from it, uh, not that I didn't literally know it, but I didn't think about it enough, is that they were so eager to stress the separation of powers that even the legislative branch has two pieces. Now, I yes. know there's a Senate and House. <laughs> I knew that before I read your book. But I always just think, well, we have a Senate and a House. I never thought about that. For them, that was also a way to weaken the power of the legislative branch, even though it was a bulwark against That's the right. judiciary and the presidency. Yeah, it's a big part. And the Senate was very different then. We should mention, to try, mention how it was different. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, having a two-house Congress was a big part of separation of powers. Uh, the whole point was to have a number of different veto points that made it difficult for government to... Act. And the House was uh, uh, the, brand, the House of the people, essentially, the closest to the people. Uh, the Senate was fully expected to be uh, dominated by aristocrats, people like them, 
uh, and uh, they were chosen by state legislatures, not by direct election. And it was fully expected that they would be a check on the House, and that both of them, of course, would check the president. Yeah, and of course, the Electoral College was a, a, an intermediary between the voice of the people and the election of the president. Yes. Again, you just sort of, we just sort of take that for granted. Uh, I've often thought about the virtues of the Electoral College, because in today's world, people are so horrified by it. But whether it's a good thing or not, in how it uh, gives incentives for presidents to campaign and who gets paid attention to and all that, it certainly was seen by the founders, you're saying, as a distancing from direct democracy. That's exactly right. It's a, it's a buffer between the presidency and the people. So, so what do you see as particularly uh, troubling about that? That seems most people think those are good things, separation of powers. You're particularly uh, eager to indict in your book the incentives that Congress faces given that system. Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, the heart of their system is Congress. Uh, Congress is uh, the lawmaker. Congress makes the laws. Um, but Congress is designed by the Constitution in such a way that the members of Congress are rooted in their districts and in their states. And therefore, uh, they are highly responsive to the narrow constituencies and special interest groups that populate those districts and states. And therefore, they are pulled in all these different directions, each of them sort of a political entrepreneur in his or her own right, and the result is that we have this institution uh, that is simply not designed to think in national terms about national problems and pr pursuing national solutions. What they're doing, is, when they are able to make legislation, is designing legislation in such a way that um, the members of the coalition, if they're going to get on board, have to be given something. Right, special provisions. So you, you have all sorts of special interest provisions that load up um, all pieces of legislation, like a Christmas tree, right? right. With um, extraneous items that please special interest groups, and the result is not actually crafted as the most effective way of solving social problems like globalization or 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 persistent poverty or health care or whatever the problem may be. Right? It was it was true. 50 years ago is true 100 years ago. It's true today, right? That this legislation that we get is really legislation that's weak, larded up with special interest provisions in order to provide political reasons for members of Congress to get on board and not intellectually justifiable uh, content that will provide an effective attack on social problems. So it really goes back to the Constitution's design that makes Congress a parochial body with members rooted in districts and states that give them political incentives to design legislation in a way that actually is not effective at solving the nation's social problems. So if we had gone back in time to the time of the founders uh, and said to them, you know, you're kind of skeptical about the value of direct democracy, yet you put in your system a desire for members of Congress to be responsive to their constituents, and that's mm -hmm. just going to lead to trouble. Uh, what would they have said? Uh, I think I know. I'm curious what you think. Uh, well, I, I think in their view, number one, government just wasn't expected to do very much, right? This is a very sure. uh, rural nation, right, of, of uh, uh, just four million people. And, and so uh, they felt that with a separation of powers design, right, in which aristocrats played a major role, that... Uh, we should probably call them elites, by the way. Aristocrats convey, connote some kind of uh, nobility, or the Earl of... I don't, I don't think so, actually. I, I, I think we did have an aristocracy. These, these were like large plantation owners. Yeah, that's true. Um, a great many of the founders owned slaves. Yep. Ten of the first twelve presidents were slave owners, right? We have to remember these things, yeah, agree. right? Okay, and so I think they felt that in constructing a separation of power system as they had and protecting their own positions as they had, that uh, any threat of um, uh, sort of uh, the people mob, rising up, mob rule, yeah, and yeah. and really dramatically changing things and expressing demands for redistribution and the like, 
you know, these, these had been minimized through their design. Well, yeah, wouldn't you say, I mean, the way I would take it is, think about it, is that uh, they would have relied on the Constitution itself to restrain some of those urges uh, of the populace, because those would have been unconstitutional. If you, would show, if you showed the, uh, er the founders today what is considered acceptable legislation, I think they'd be shocked. So people like me who want a smaller government, I uh, want government to be less involved. We tend to argue for a more a strict constructionist mm -hmm. approach to the Constitution. I'm willing to concede that that's a naive form of reform. The idea that we can put that genie back in the bottle, I mm -hmm. think, is is a form of um, somewhat akin to what Yuval Levin talks about in the Fractured Republic. He was a guest on this program talking about misplaced nostalgia yeah. that might not apply <laughs> to today's world. And yes. for me, as a uh, you know, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. So where those of us who are more libertarian, where's our golden age, 1790, but with free slaves, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so that's a little bit, I, you know, to indict myself, that's uh -huh. a little bit uh, naive. So the, the fact is, where are we are? We are where we are, which is a powerful Congress not prone to look for national uh, n problem solving things, rather look for ways to aggrandize themselves, profit. And stay in office. So, and Congress is that way by virtue of its design. So one of the examples that I love in the book, which I didn't know about, is uh, which is very illustrative. It's a little bit of cherry picking, which, of course, is your right as the author of the book to pick the most dramatic cases to make your tell your story. But talk about the model cities, because that's just kind of stunning. And it's yeah. kind of a perfect example, so I understood why. It's a, it. it's a great example. Uh, so during uh, President Johnson's war on poverty in the 1960s, uh, he set up a bunch of ta task forces to address uh, various social problems, and one of them was the problem of urban decay, uh, which was very serious, right? and something needed to be done about it. This task force that he set up uh, was filled with experts uh, and people from the bureaucracy uh, who knew something about this problem, um, and, and one legislator, Senator Abraham Ribicoff right, from Connecticut. Connecticut. Yeah. And so they came up with this idea, which was a novel idea, um, of uh, instead of like dribbling money into cities to try to help them, they would concentrate money on a small number of, quote, model cities. And, and their idea was, okay, we'll pick five or maybe ten uh, big cities and we'll concentrate money on those cities and really show what can be done when the money is concentrated. That or what can't the, be done. That, know, was the, that was their idea. It's kind of a lab idea. It's like an experiment. experiment. Yeah, it's a nice right. idea. Right. And, and so uh, Ribicoff uh, said, you know, this is a great idea, but you should really have 50 cities, right? One for each senator, right? To, to, give, to give senators... One for each state, yeah. To give senators a reason to vote for, yeah, sure. right? I would have yeah. said 33. Or, or one for each state, sorry. But yeah. what, what each senator could then claim, you know, some... Yeah, right, right. One, excuse me, one for each state. But, but each right. senator could claim it was their, theirs or whatever, but That's 34 right. would have been fine too, yeah. but 50 is safer. So then, so then uh, listening to that, the, the committee itself decided, okay, we'll expand the number of cities. They actually expanded it to like 66, sent it over to Congress, House, and of course people in the House wanted more cities, oh, right? Sure. I mean, this just wasn't enough for them, <laughs> right? And so in the end, model cities was adopted, right? And uh, they wound up selecting over 150 model cities. Right, each of which got very little Pittance. money. Yeah, yeah, in, and it included quote cities like um, uh, Smithville, Tennessee, important, right? Yep. Wh which has a couple thousand people, yeah. but was the hometown of Joe Evans, who sat, who chaired the appropriations subcommittee, who was in charge of this whole thing. Shock, right? Yeah, actually, the good news is it was less than four hundred and thirty-five. You know, if we did, you, did, you might have predicted it'd be even more than yeah, really, one hundred and fifty, right. but. Right. So, th so then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, then what's the point? Yeah. What is the point? What, the, the idea was to address the problem of urban decay. And so they passed this legislation. What is that thing that they passed? What is the point of that thing? The only point of it was to funnel money into the districts and the states yeah. of the members of Congress. And that really typifies the way Congress approaches all kinds of legislation. Right? They're not actually trying to solve a national problem in the most effective possible way. They're just trying to pass legislation that will benefit them as political entrepreneurs. So I would argue that uh, there's nothing new under the sun, that that's been the case since 
roughly Absolutely. 1789. I'm with you. The, the, the <laughs> only change is that I think some of the restraints on the legislative process that the Constitution used to impose have now been loosened so that it's worse than ever. I, I would argue that what we would call a Christmas tree or pork barrel or um, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, log rolling, all of these are various words with different levels of cynicism. And, right. Uh, but this is an old problem. Yeah, absolutely. And that's our point, right, that it goes all the way back. It's, this is not a new thing. It's a constitutional thing. And you then argue uh, that uh, the president is better equipped to deal with national problems and therefore we, we need to make the president more powerful, uh, which to me is a horrifying thought at first. So I, I'm <laughs> going to say from, up front that, um, that particularly in 2016, the idea of an even more powerful president seems somewhat alarming. But I just want to give a little foreshadowing uh -huh. to, to the listeners. I will say that your method for doing it is, is quite interesting. So please don't, don't hang up the don't put your phone away, listeners. Uh, so, but let's first talk about the presidency. What, yeah. what are the, what's unique about the presidency relative to Congress? Okay, I, I, I think it's really important to recognize that members of Congress have their incentives structured in a very distinctive way to behave in the ways we've just discussed. They are parochial. They will be unable to provide us with effective government. My right? Congress is a pathological institution. Right, and it is... You're doing but, great so far, Terry. I mean, I'm totally, <laughs> we're 100% agreed. Keep going. <laughs> okay. So it's so, a sausage factory, you know? Uh, yeah, and, and absolutely. You don't absolutely. want to watch, and you're not going to yeah. like what it tastes like when it comes out. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so presidents are motivated very, very differently. Presidents um, have a national constituency. They benefit themselves as politicians from thinking in national terms about national problems and adopting national solutions that work, okay? And then have a longer run time frame, as you point out in the book. Yeah, well, the thing is, they care about their legacies. This is a really crucial thing. People joke about this, you yeah. know, that they sit around obsessing about their legacies. This sure is a do. very good thing, yeah. right? Because what they're thinking is, I want to be great. I want to be regarded as the greatest president who ever lived. Well, how do they do that? Well, they have to take on major problems for society, like when President Bush took on Social Security, for instance. That's that kind of thing and resolve them in a way that people will look back on 20 years from now, 50 years from now, and say, man, what a great president. Right? Right. So presidents are thinking in the long term about durable, effective policy solutions, and they're the only ones doing that. So um, our solution is not to make the president a dictator, but to just say, look, we have a system in which we have a Congress, we have a president, but Congress is pathological. It will never provide us with effective government. We're awash in Correct. social problems that romance. need to be dealt with somehow. That's just romance. And so what we're suggesting is that we simply shift a measure of power from Congress to the president. Now, this doesn't make the president a dictator. We're just looking at one aspect of their constitutional, excuse me, constitutional relationship, which is the legislative process. Now, before we get to that, I just want to push back for a second on uh -huh. the legacy thing. Because, uh -huh. of course, the legacy... Uh, the desire to have a, a great legacy, while has many beneficial things, also uh -huh. has some negative things. So doing very little is not the road to being a remembered president. So right. there's a natural bias built into the presidency because of that desire for legacy to, quote, do something. And I would argue that, say, in foreign policy, uh, it's like you, know, you give a person a hammer, you look for a nail. You put the president in charge of uh, the U.S. military, he he or she does have a perhaps does have a tendency to use it uh, in hopes of doing something that is memorable. Of course, it often backfires. You give the example of Lyndon Johnson. Vietnam certainly tarnishes legacy tremendously. Uh, George Bush's legacy perhaps will be tarnished. It seems that now it is right now. It may change, but it's certainly tarnished by the war in Iraq. Uh, does that worry at all? Uh, no, not not really. I mean, I, I, for instance, with George H. W. Bush could have gone That's into Iraq one. and didn't do that. Correct. Right? He chose not to do that. Correct. Right? Why? I think he's thinking about what's best because he's responsible for the thing. True. Right? Okay. Um, also, take uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, what Ronald Reagan wanted to do, in quotes, was to cut back on the size of government. Right? To retrench 
the welfare state. I assume this is the kind of thing that you would like. Um, it would right? be the first thing and, I'd pick, but it's not the worst thing. Okay, but, yeah. it, but this is an example of a president doing something that's actually making government smaller or trying to. I don't think he was successful no. at that. But, and he was, un, he was unsuccessful because our government provides him with a structure that's unworkable. Yeah. Right? So this is another example of why we have a government that's so ineffective, because you have a guy like Ronald Reagan who comes in that wants to do something big. Can he do it? No. Right? Well, you use, you use Obamacare as, a, as an example of a, a disappointing policy because it, it kowtowed too much to what Congress wanted in the design. And he certainly turned over many of its provisions to Congress. Uh, ironically, it was a disaster for the congressional uh, members of Congress who voted for it. It was a rare moment, I think, where Congress, I think mistakenly, but they uh. thought it was either they thought the political cost would be smaller or they thought that the national interest was more important. They wanted to do, be a part of something they thought was great. They actually, in some sense, seem to have acted against their self-interest in that, in that setting. But your general point would be that, that that legislation is way too complicated for what it could have been. Well, I think, uh, uh, number one, it was a landmark and a breakthrough and an unusual piece of legislation. Presidents had been trying for 60 years to do something about universal health insurance, right? And they had all failed. This included Nixon and Ford. It wasn't just Democrats. That's a great point. Um, and, 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 and so then Obama was successful at doing this. Okay, so then the question is, what did he do? Well, Obamacare is a mess. Why is it a mess? Because there are really powerful interest groups that have a lot of power within Congress, and they were able to step up and really uh, shape this legislation. And so, you know, why can't we import drugs from Canada, you know, to get less expensive drugs? Well, the pharmaceutical companies say no. Why can't the government bargain with the pharmaceutical companies like they do in other countries to keep drug prices low? Pharmaceutical companies are against that, right? So we pay higher drug prices by a lot compared to people in other countries, you know? Same thing for the insurance companies. Same thing for the trial lawyers. You go right down the list. They all got their special provisions in this act. And there are all these special interests that are protecting the employer-based insurance system that arose after World War II, right? That leaves millions of people uncovered. And so what, what the reformers did was to just cobble together something, layer it on top of the existing system, right? And what you end up with is a mess because there is no legislative process that actually allows for a coherent, intellectually well-justified kind of policy to emerge. So let me make the argument a different way, which appeals a little bit more to me. Uh, when we passed, uh, not passed, when, when employer-based health care became common uh -huh. in the aftermath of World War II, uh, it just, um, it was a result of the way the tax system was set up. It's, no one sat around and said, wouldn't it be great to get your health insurance to your job? It's a bad right. idea, right? right. N nobody would say that's a, that's a great way to structure it. Right. So then you say, well, yeah, we ought to fix that. Right. And as the system, uh, as things um, glom onto it over time, it becomes literally unchangeable. There's no ability to ratchet back and say, you know, in, in 2016, when people change jobs frequently, uh, when some people, are, you know, of course, are going to be unemployed, when health care has gotten incredibly expensive because we've taken out all the incentives to keep it cheaper, and so therefore not having health insurance is much worse than it was in 1950, you'd say, well, yeah, well, this whole thing, part of the root of this is this really bad idea of employer-based health care. Right. Let's start from scratch. And you can't, partly because over time, you've tweaked the system in various ways to respond to the special interests that you're talking about. And the ability to go back to square one, to sunset basically a law, a legislation that, that establishes something like the system we have, is virtually impossible. I, I can't think, but I'm not that imaginative, I can't think of any example where we sort of said, gee, times have changed so much, let's start over. We tried a little bit with health, with uh, agriculture, and you mentioned that in your book, right? We tried to, we kind of realized that's this didn't whole, work. Yeah, and... And with the tax system. Correct. Right, the 1986 Tax Reform Act. Right, so we get this big reform, and then after a while, Congress's incentives just kick back in, and they lard it up with 15,000 more special interest provisions. And it's really worse than it looks because <laughs> yes. it, it does incur, to the extent you can go back to square one, start from scratch, clean slate, uh, it then just 
rebuilds itself up again. So it's kind of like we need to resell this rug <laughs> in the bazaar. We need to build this mess again. So we'll yeah. we'll pretend we're doing this for the good of the country, but of course we know that over time it's just going to get back to where we are. And that's for them a feature, not a bug, because it's like we could then sell effectively through influence money, et cetera, uh, these ex new provisions and special carve-outs for people who want them. That's right. This, the system remains in place, right? And, and so even if you achieve a, a, a major reform like the, the Tax Reform Act in 1986, the system is still there. Congress is still there. The incentives are still the same. And sure enough, the, the old problems with the old tax system just grow right back. And before you know it, you have 15,000 special interest provisions added to it. Each one. And, and with, with health care, um, the, the point that I, I wanted to add to what you said, which I think is correct, you know, you have this, this employer-based system that grew up after the war, and then you have all these interests like insurance companies uh, and even um, employers that have a stake in that system right. and in keeping that system. Okay, well, they have political power. Where do they have political power? In Congress. Yep. And so if you try to, if you come along and you say, hey, we should do this differently in a way that includes everybody, not just people who have jobs, and is cost-effective. And here's a coherent way of doing that. Okay, you have no chance of getting something like that passed. Why? Because of the political system that we have that privileges special interests and members of Congress from all over the country that are responding to those interests rather than trying to do something for the nation as a whole. And when times change and people change jobs more often and people realize, and the Congress realizes, see, this is a problem with the current system, then they attach other things to the current monster. Layer, layer them on. Cobra. And I'll say, oh, yeah, we yeah. got to fix that. But instead of fixing it, really, they just kind of yes. do a Band-Aid that actually probably not very effective. Right. Um, so you don't want a dictator, right, a, ben a benign dictator. That would be one solution, not a very attractive or realistic one. So what do you want? What, how can we enlarge the power of the presidency without damaging uh, the, the incentives that, that are good about being president? Yeah, well, we think that there's a very simple way of making a big dent in the problem anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what we're proposing is just leaving the whole Constitution in place. I, uh, it's hard and, to imagine a, a realistic and, strategy. Yeah, and, make, and making just one small, very realistic kind of change to the, the way legislation is handled. That's, that's all. Okay, and what it involves is adopting a fast-track reform, as we've had in international trade for 40 years. We have a lot of experience with this. Uh, and Fast Track, then, under our proposal, would cover everything, all policy proposals. So um, that, the way it would work is that the, the, uh, the president would propose uh, a policy on anything. And whatever it is, whether it deals with taxes or with uh, welfare or with the environment or you name it, uh, Congress would have to vote on it within a particular period of time, say 90 days. It would have to vote up or down, and it would have to vote on a majoritarian basis. Right? So no filibusters, no delays. Now, Congress can vote no. Right? Yeah. So the president still has to win over both the Senate and the House. Majorities. Right. To get majorities, to get these things passed. But the president would be the one who designs these policies. Congress would have no right to reach in and add special interest provisions or take provisions out or to basically muddle up and mess up what is, in fact, a coherent policy package. Why would we expect it to be coherent? Because presidents, um, unlike all the other players, have the strongest incentives to craft policies in the most effective ways because their legacy depends upon that. So this, this is all it comes down to, right? And so people can say, hey, you know, you're making the president more powerful. Look, it's only more powerful in this one way, right, which, which gives the president the capacity to craft policies in effective ways, which the nation desperately needs. But we still have separation of powers in place. Congress still has to say yes to anything that happens. We still have a Supreme Court and the entire court system. We still have the Bill of Rights, right? Basically, everything is exactly the same. And people could say, well, what about, you know, unilateral action by presidents? These are horrible things the president... This has nothing to do with that. It doesn't affect that at all. It, that's the same. Uh, as, it, as it is now.
right? Our book is not about that, and the reform is not about it. It's just about changing the legislative process so that the actual policies that come out of it are better. So again, the book is called Relic, which is a great title, by the way, even though I disagree with it. Um, uh, you spoke, when you described this idea, you said the president would propose a policy. But of course, presidents don't propose policies. You're really talking about uh, presidents putting forth legislation in a, and having legislation originate in the executive branch rather than in the congressional branch, which you're suggesting is really the source of the problem. I mean, I can't, well, I can't have a policy that says, I wish workers made more money. Uh, you got it. You got explicit. Well, that's not what I mean. mean by policy. Yeah. What do you I mean, mean, you would have to have a policy uh, that is designed, l let's say, minimum wage. Yeah. Right. A minimum wage policy. Okay, that's a policy, and and uh, there's a real structure to it, and rules, and so on, and it specifies what has to happen, and and so okay, though that policy is proposed, and under fast track, Congress would have to vote on it as it is. They can't mess with it. But when you say vote on it, yeah. it has to be explicit. It can't just be. Sure. We'll have a higher minimum wage. It would have to say how much. It would have to say. But that's who the would way it is. To. That's the way policies are now. Like when they're, Agreed. they're but bills that go through Congress, right? The question just, is, who's going to write them? That's what I'm saying. That's what you're proposing. That, yeah. that, that, that they originate instead of this this uh, um, Byzantine committee system, yeah. uh, which you quote Steve Tellis, former econ talk guest, as a kludgeocracy with yes. all these veto points. Instead, it would originate in the executive branch and then be subject effectively to congressional veto. Yes. Unlike the current system, which is it originates in the congressional branch su right. subject to presidential veto, which, which raises a question. Why don't presidents, given their ability to veto more bills and given that most bills that you're suggesting do not serve the national interest, why don't they veto more of them and be the check on that? Christmas tree, log rolling, pork barreling problem that you're talking about? Because then I think um, government would just grind to a halt. Um, uh, presidents aren't overridden very often in their vetoes. Uh, and so if anything is ever going to happen, presidents have to go along. It's like with Obamacare. You know, why did Obama basically turn over Obamacare to Congress and let Congress write it? Which he also did, by, by the way, with the stimulus package to the horror of many yeah, economists. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and I, I was think, against the package, but yeah, welcome to separation worse, of powers. Even worse that he let Congress design it. Yeah, I, welcome to separation of powers. I, I, Obama was just recognizing that he could not determine the outcome. He he needed congressional support. The only way he was going to get it was by letting them do these things, and he had to. And the example in the case of Obamacare was what happened to Clinton. Right. So Clinton had this massive health care program that he designed in the White House and members of Congress weren't going to have it. Yeah. And it went down in flames and it, w it was one of the biggest policy fiascos Correct. in modern history. And right. a disaster for him in so many Absolutely. ways because of it. And Obama wasn't going to go there. Right. So we, that right. way it was smart on his part whether the results are worth, worth different. Well, questions. I think Obama was thinking this is the best I can do. Yeah. So. Basically, to summarize, you're suggesting we need to have Congress's role in legislation be an up-down only response to to a, a bill, rather than their current policy of feeding it through the congressional uh, sausage factory. But let me just add add to this that um, we do say that Congress can still pass its own legislation, just like they do now. Uh, presidents can veto it. But members of Congress can go ahead and pass legislation. We're not taking that away from them. What we're adding is fast-track authority for presidents. So any time the president wants to make a proposal to Congress, fast-track kicks in, and Congress has to vote on that proposal up or down within X number of days. Without amendment, writers. Without amendment. Complications. Without filibusters. And, you know, presidents will be smart about that. They'll want to get these things passed. And I think that will lead to more policies getting passed that are effectively designed rather than these weak, cobbled together, godforsaken things like model cities that Congress passes. Would the budget go through this process? Yes. How would that happen? Because it could? Because presidents would then just propose a budget that Congress would have to vote on? Presidents do propose a budget by, uh, hey, by the forgot. OMB. I forgot. <laughs> it's so, right? It's kind of a sh theater piece of theater, sham kind of And also thing. there will be communication back and forth, 
right? Presidents They're in the same city, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. So they will talk, and presidents will want to anticipate what Congress is going to do. But this does give presidents the upper hand in crafting something that's more like what they want. So I kind of like this, kind of. Um, it, what you're really saying is, again, just to make clear, it's an additional option, not changing, quote, anything else in yes. theory. Right. Um, how would it happen practically? What would have to be done? Uh, so how did, let's go back to Fast Track. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back later to the question of whether people are happy with Fast Track or not. Uh, it's a complicate your sell, your marketing of your idea. But how did Fast Track get approved? Who, how did that get Congress set up? approved it. So would they have to approve what you're talking about? Uh, well, why this would, would they? This would be an approval of a constitutional amendment. Why yeah. would it have to be a constitutional amendment? Uh, because it changes the nature of the, uh, well, it doesn't have to, okay. right? Uh, but uh, what we would want is, is a fast-track authority that would be permanent, right, for all legislation, and Congress is not going to do that. And I they could not. revoke it at any time, right? Right, which kind of ruins the yeah, whole Yeah, it wrecks the whole thing, right? So what you need is a constitutional amendment. Will Congress do that? No, I, I don't think so. Unless something odd happens, it's always possible, like, like when Congress uh, gave presidents the... Uh, uh, um, line item veto, right, under Newt Gingrich, right, that the Supreme Court struck that. down, right? Yeah. Every now and then something weird like that happens, right? Yeah. But basically, Congress is not going to do this. Uh, the alternative they is. They celebrate your book and they realize that. Yeah, it was right. And they're power. persuaded by ideas. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, <laughs> the, the alternative is, is for the state legislatures to uh, request a constitutional convention that would then adopt. This amendment, a constitutional convention. Yeah, but once we have a constitutional convention, everything's up for grabs. Right? Okay, so that's uh, never been a good. That's always been a, a tough sell. Why can't we do the thing? Just go around get petitions and in each state referenda sign it in each get enough states. Is that another way we can get a constitutional amendment? Um, I think that scholars are unclear about exactly how this would work, um, and. Um, my own view is that our job in this paper, a book, is to try to get people to understand that the Constitution has major consequences for our lives, that it undermines effective government, that it's up to us to try to do something about it, and to try to get people interested in doing something about it. And then the question is, okay, how can this thing actually happen on the ground well, okay, Congress is unlikely to want such an amendment. Right, so that's one way. So we need to try to amendment. get around Congress, and one way to do it is through the convention route, through the states. And I think when I said that scholars were unclear about this, it's unclear whether the convention can be constrained to consider, say, one amendment, and that, that it would be called only to consider that one amendment. But there is another way to get a constitutional amendment passed, right? Can't you just have, can't you have each state vote within a certain period of time to get a constitutional amendment? Well, I think what you're talking about is Congress, like with the Equal Rights yeah, Amendment, Yeah, didn't right? they go state by state? Well, first, Congress adopted it. Oh. And then three-fourths of the states have to say oh, yes. So that's going to be a non-starter. Yes. So this is close to a non-starter, though. I think the idea... Mm, I don't think it is. Okay, to make the case for me, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking... You're telling me that scholars aren't sure whether you could constrain a constitutional convention. I mean, that. But how would that work? How would how would a constitutional convention in 2017 say? Uh, who's in it? Who's going to be at the in Philadelphia? Who's well, there? we haven't had one of those, right? Uh, in eons, yeah. Right? Uh, and we don't talk about that in the book on exactly how this would happen. So uh, to tell bonus you, bonus feature here on Econ Talk. Go ahead. Huh? A bonus feature here for Econ Talk listeners. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think we can say we don't know exactly what would have to happen in order for Fast Track to be adopted as part of the Constitution because this is like new terrain uh, moving forward. Um, and I think it should be done very carefully. And I, like you, am concerned about the risks of this. I and, and William Howell... Uh, uh, oh, well, we're, we're both concerned um, about maintaining the rest of the Constitution and preserving and protecting it. Except for that Second Amendment, right? Because that's a silly one. They didn't mean militia. They meant militias. We don't want to go there. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. But 
No, I'm kidding, but you know, how would you keep the people attending that convention from doing something with an amendment that you and I well, say might again, like or uh, not? This just raises legal issues about uh, how these conventions actually get set up and what their uh, sco proper scope, whether the scope can be constrained. And I'm not a legal scholar. I don't know the answer to that. But I'm a political scientist, and I think my job, first and foremost, is to try to understand the consequences that the Constitution has uh, for our governance today and to identify ways that we might be able to move forward. And I think this is one of them. And, you know, it may be that, that it wouldn't work out in, as a practical matter, but we should think about these things. I like the idea of it. I like the idea of thinking about it. I'm not sure how to get there from here in a way that's maybe comforting to me. But, you know, I think the other challenge you have in marketing the idea, say, to the general public, and it, it, to me it's imaginable that out of shame uh, and perhaps an unusual set of events, Congress mm -hmm. could yes. pass such a uh, potential con constitutional amendment that would be voted on by many states, and we could get there mm -hmm. through this other more comforting, yes. comforting method. But isn't one of the challenges that the, just the, even the very phrase fast track Ha has a marketing problem to the American people, given that, for better or for worse, many of them think that trade agreements have been a ripoff of America's interests. I think that's incorrect for most, in, as a general principle. It's a general statement, but most Americans don't agree with me, uh, or at least I, don't, I worry that they don't. Most people would say, oh, it's going to be like trade agreements? That's horrible. How are you going to convince them otherwise? Okay, well, first of all, I'm not a PR expert, and I, I don't think of this uh, in terms of PR. You know, I, I, I think uh, the lesson of Fast Track is that um, if presidents are going to negotiate trade agreements, and of course they don't do it personally, I mean, yeah. they have their people who, who do it, right? right? And, the and if they're going to deal with all these nations out there, they cannot have Congress meddling in all the details, right? So presidents are able to craft an actual agreement that nations have signed on to. And it is crucial that that coherent, well-justified, well-integrated thing not be ruined by being torn apart in Congress, right? So Fast Track is made for that. And it has worked really well over time. Now, this other question of whether we should be entering in, into these trade agreements in the first place is, is another issue. Now, in the past, Congress has voted yes. On most, most, not always, right. but it's been voted yes on these things. I suspect that uh, going forward, they're less likely to vote yes, right? yes unless correct. those agreements are changed. But the importance of fast track is get it, allowing the emergence of a coherent agreement that Congress can vote on. It says nothing about whether Congress is going to vote yes or no. They can vote no, and I think in today's environment, they're likely to. Yeah, I think I think the challenge. I I, I think about Milton Friedman. I talked to him one time. Uh, uh, about NAFTA, and he said, well, I'm against it. And I said, I, why? And he said, well, because a free trade, trade agreement should be one page. It should be, say, we hereby eliminate all our tariffs and quotas for products from Canada and Mexico. And in fact, NAFTA is a big, fat, thick set of right. regulations. Now, my view, which I might be naive, but my view is that most of those regulations, most of the pages of NAFTA were about slowing down the pace of certain tariff removals, keeping some in place, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, but that it was a movement toward free trade and better than nothing. Not as good as what Milton wanted, of right. course, but but what, what, what would seem to me to be the case is to the extent it is a uh, bad bit of legislation. And to mm -hmm. take one example, uh, the truckers, uh, the trucking industry was very unhappy about the idea that Mexican truckers would come into the United States, so they, on the basis of alleged safety concerns, which that were foolish, uh, and silly and mm. dishonest, because what they really cared about was pocketbook. They they decided that those would not be phased in for 10 years. And I think when the 10 years was up, they still didn't phase it in, et cetera, et cetera. So even with Fast Track, mm. we have many of the special interest provisions that you are concerned about. They just come in through the making sure Congress still votes for it problem. Yes. So it is, to many in many ways, the separation of powers that you're trying to open a little bit, it's not, doesn't disappear. The no, problems, the problems so, of the separation of So let me of powers. just frame that a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, we have a separation of powers system. Uh, ultimately, uh, the president can't have what he wants, 
Uh, he, he can craft the policy that Congress has to vote on, and he wants Congress to vote yes. Right. Therefore, they he has say. to make sure that he has a majority in the House and the Senate. Therefore, he has to, like, bargain with these people, right? So you get into the same kinds of problems with special interests and all the rest. However, the president is the champion of effective government. He wants these policies to be effective and coherent and to work. And so they are in the hands of the one person who doesn't want to give up the essence of the policy by, by actually, you know, allowing all these perversions to get in there. And so the problem is minimized by, by giving him more power. See, that's the thing. It's not that the problem goes away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, let's talk about some of the bigger issues underlying these, these points. It's, you know, it's a very provocative book. It's also short, by the way, which I really appreciate. It's only about 180 pages. Which, yeah, with, with uh, big print and it's big, big margins. Print, relatively big print, yeah. <laughs> so for some, that's a, you know, it's, uh, you don't get as much for your dollar. For others, it's a big feature, not a bug. Uh, you, you indict the Constitution very uh, vigorously in the beginning of the book. One perspective would be, well, you know, I, I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah, I can see there are all these bad, this legislation that's messy and ugly and doesn't really do what it might do, but... You know, over time, it's been a pretty good run. Are you, really, are you suggesting that it's just now that things are not going well? Is, is it the trend you don't like? Is it the nature of the problems we face? Because I would argue that many of the problems we face at the national level, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are problems the president can deal with if he wants to. A lot of them are related to foreign policy, terrorism, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Is the Constitution a secret of our success? Look, I, I think you regard it as an indictment of the Constitution because... Almost nobody. It's called relic, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> almost nobody um, uh, thinks in objective terms about the Constitution's actual impacts True. on modern governance. There's too much uh, Constitution worship. And everybody's down on their knees uh, worshiping the founders and the Constitution instead of thinking objectively about it. It's not a perfect thing. It, it doesn't affect us in 100% good ways. So, in the end... What we're saying is, look, it undermines effective government. There are things we can do about it, right? We never said anything about getting rid of the Bill of Rights, you know, or getting rid of separation of powers or getting rid of Congress. We didn't say any of those things, right? It's a way of making an adjustment that will make this structure almost entirely intact more effective. So I think if you say, oh, you know, the, the president can do a pretty good job, of, if, we, if everything stays the same, of dealing with today's problems. No, we can't. And that's what our book is about. Okay, so let me try a different approach. Uh, one of the ways that uh, sometimes we summarize the uh, essence of economics on this program is no solutions, only trade-offs. So when you talk about the big issues in the book, immigration, health care, education, um, we really don't, I don't want a president who can solve those because they really can't be solved. At best, what the president could do, even if the president did have the kind of authority you're talking about, at best what the president could do is help some groups of Americans at the expense of others solve, improve one set of issues at the expense of others. Or do you think that there are, quote, solutions to health care, immigration, education that would just be obviously better than, than others? Well, I think, think this is a democracy, right? So what counts as a problem and what counts as a solution is in part a matter of democratic perspective. What is, what is it that people want, right? Well, I, um, I, I actually don't agree with that. So you, you can leave me. You can, I was going to raise the, the Okay, point. I think most people would agree with what I just said, but maybe I, you don't. Well, I know, I, I know they that's do. That's fine. Well, when you say what the people want, I don't know what that is. There is no, that's really my point, is that there's no unified... Other than being uh, avoiding a nuclear attack on the United States that kills uh -huh. everybody or being uh, overcome by a foreign aggressor, our interests are not unanimous. And the will of the people is a will of the wisp. It's a, uh, you know, the arrow impossibility theorem makes it yeah. pretty clear. All right. You got, so, you got the question. But basically, <laughs> yeah, we, we have a democratic political system in which we have elections and uh, we have leaders who are elected. They run based upon promises that they are making about how they're going to deal with the major social problems of our times. That's what this campaign is about. It's what every campaign is about, always, yep. right? Republicans have different solutions than Democrats do, but they're always talking about how we're going to solve these, these problems.
Well, that's because people want to hear that. They, they don't want to hear that they can't be solved and that there's only trade-offs. Oh, and, they want them solved. Well, that's you a, know, an illusion. You don't. But that's an illusion. You can't solve those problems. You can only... Maybe you can do something about yeah, them. Yeah, that's true. That's right. And, so, and some things that are done are more effective than others, right? And so what you want is a government that can be effective at dealing with these things. So, you know, you take immigration. You know, we have 11 million people or so who are here without documentation. Uh, uh, the laws are not being adhered to. The laws are meaningless, right? So this is a legal system in crisis. Uh, we also have farmers uh, uh, in California who can't get enough workers for their fields. We have uh, 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 Silicon Valley uh, workplaces who would love to bring in um, uh, highly talented uh, immigrants from other countries who can't get them in. Uh, whereas in other countries, they, they adjust their immigration system to make sure they are able to attract these highly talented people. Right. So, so this is a system that clearly uh, constitutes a problem and um, calls out for a solution. Right. Some kind of solution that would be better than what we have now. Right. And I think almost everybody, maybe not you, but almost everybody thinks, yeah, we can do a lot better than this. Okay. So in uh, 2005 and six and seven, President Bush submitted a bipartisan bill that, that uh, had great support in Congress, actually. And in 2007 and 2008, that bill, um, those bills, went down to defeat due to a filibuster in the Senate. Actually, there was majority support in Congress to pass those bills. In 2013, Obama, uh, proposed a bill that went down, even though it had majority support. And the reason it went down was that John Boehner used his agenda powers in the House to just not bring it up for a vote, even though there was a majority there that would have voted for it. Under fast track, those things would have passed, right? We'd, we would actually have had immigration reform that reconstructed immigration law and that did something about the 11 million undocumented immigrants and that did something about the Silicon Valley so, problem and the agriculture right, so problem. So why did that not happen? Now, don't give me the answer, which is obviously literally true. We talk about causation. There's, there's the ultimate cause and the penultimate cause, and the, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it didn't happen because certain people stopped it from happening. But what would you say is the political reason? What were the forces in motion that kept that kind of change? And I'm agnostic. I went, that was a good idea. Now, I didn't look at mm -hmm. any of those bills. I wouldn't pay attention to them at the time. But, but something under something real, not just the... Desire for people. Okay, to well, I, I can give you a, a, a democratic perspective on it. Yeah. Institutional perspective, which is that in our system, perversely, we have filibusters in the Senate. Right. And even though there was majority support in Congress for this thing in 2006 and 2007, a minority in one house of the legislature torpedoed so those why? bills. So why? Why did they do that? They could. Part of the reason you're saying right. that is because they could. But why? Why were they willing to do that? Um, what was their interest? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I would say one response is who cares what their interest? They're a minority, right? The, the, this bill has overwhelming support in a democratic system. And whatever these people, you know, 30 people or however many there are, 40 people. It's a republic, though. It's not a direct democracy. Well, all right. If you they are a it. tiny number compared yeah, to the numbers agreed. of people who are willing to vote for this thing. Yeah. But, but I'm right? biased. I'm a big worrier about the tyranny of the majority, whether it's the people or the, the legislators. So in this case, this smaller group, I agree it's not a, was not a majority, yeah. decided to stand athwart this change yeah, and say I think stop. That the, the they single, had some interest in doing so. The single so. most important thing, I think, is that uh, uh, Republicans want to stand in the way of anything that looks like a path to, to citizenship for um, Latinos. Who are more likely to vote. Absolutely. Two, there they're two-to-one Democrat. Yep. Right. Okay. That's, a, that's, I think, true and not a good reason to stop the bill. So that, that's interesting. Now, there are other, there's other legislation, I assume, that is stopped for other reasons. That was a purely mm -hmm. political calculation. It's a cynical view, but I suspect you're probably right. Yeah, but I think it's also important not to judge other people's calculations and just <laughs> say, oh, different people have different interests, fine. So what kind of system are we going to have for designing policy given that people don't agree? Okay, well, if we have a system of uh, filibusters yeah. 
right, and two houses and all the rest, okay, well, you know, basically, if we have any kinds of problems that are at all complicated and serious, right, you're not going to get anything. And if you do, you're going to get some god-awful thing that doesn't really solve the problem. Yeah. Welcome to American democracy. Welcome to American institutions. And it goes all the way back to the Constitution. Yeah. Well, I kind of like it, I have to say, because I'm a, I wish government did less rather than more. I think the to sell people like me, not that we matter, because we're also a very small minority, uh, I, it just, it's, I, I'm willing to concede the possibility that this kind of institutional change, if it could be agreed on, might make things better, that it, government might get smaller, it's conceivable, as you suggest in the book, uh, and so that it's not necessarily that getting rid of, say, filibuster mm -hmm. might not just mean government's going to get bigger at a faster rate. Right. right. Yeah. Let me just add something here, I, because you bring up the small government thing. Um, our book is not about big government versus small government. I, I think what, what people often think is, oh, well, you think government, uh, effective government, is all about solving social problems. That's what it sounds right. like. Yeah. Um, and it is, right? But that's what Reagan was trying to do. What Reagan was saying is, hey, the welfare state is a social problem, right? It's right. way too expensive. We shouldn't be doing most of these things. Ruining people's we, lives. We need to cut back on the welfare state, right? That was his social problem, True. right? And so what could he do about that? Not, not a lot, right? Why? Right, because we have a government that is set up for sheer ineffectiveness, and he was mired in it. Yeah, well, that's right? a very good answer. Okay, so what I would say is if you favor small government, you should favor small effective government. Right? And you're never going to get to small government, because we have a really big government, you're never going to get to small government unless you have an effective government where a leader can come in and say, okay, this is what we're going to do, and it actually happens. Yeah, so I, actually I agree with you. I think you're, in theory your proposal is even more attractive to a large government person who, uh, you know, I always want to say if, if government stuck to what, it's, what it does well, uh, many more people would be positive toward it and <laughs> be willing to let it do more than it does now. The fact that it does so much so poorly, to me, suggests putting less in the government's control and more in the control of individuals, uh, either acting in voluntary ways through charity or through their own individual decisions, uh, and we'd have a better government. So that would be great, but we don't have that world. We have the sausage factory and how right. anyone in the presence of the sausage factory can advocate putting more things into, onto the plate of, of Congress is Right. Strange to me, but there's a lot of romance in politics, so that's that's not. So I'm with you. I mean, I I don't want the sausage factory to be in charge, and so what we're saying is, look, the sausage factory is a reality, and it's not going away. Right. Right. Correct. So what we want to do is recognize it for what it is. Say this is a constitutional thing. It's not an accident. It's not going to go away ever. <laughs> so what we should do is like move it to the periphery of the legislative process and shift power to the champion of effective government, the president, just in the legislative process and only there, right, so that he makes the proposals and the sausage factory only gets to vote yes or no. They don't get to make sausage, right? He's the one who's designing policy, not them. And so I like that. Let's, that part of it, it's, it is appealing. Uh, let's close with a, a, a sort of meta question about these kind of issues for me, which is, you know, a lot of times we hear people say, you know, we should be more like Scandinavia or we should be more like country X. That, and, you know, my, my, there's a lot of, I have a lot of different responses to that intellectually and emotionally. But one of the responses is, well, we're not a lot like Scandinavia as a nation, not just because we have a smaller population uh, above the Arctic Circle. We're not like Scandinavia because we're an incredibly heterogeneous country. And many policies that seem to work well, you know, my, my favorite example is the bureaucracy. Being a bureaucrat in many countries of the world is considered an honorable profession mm -hmm. and, and a, something people strive for and get prestige from. Not so much in America, right? Uh, we have a different attitude. People will chalk that up to our individuality and our, our frontier origins. And I think it really misses what really is driving both our attitudes toward these kind of issues and our attitudes toward uh, the policies that come out of Washington, which is that incredibly heterogeneous country. So some of the sausage that comes out of this isn't the result of special interests per se manipulating the system. It's the fact that we're really diverse. Our interests are not always unified. And that's the fundamental reason that we get bad policy. 
And, and, and so my lesson from that, of course, is well, let's put fewer things into the into the into the the grinder, and let's leave more of it outside of Washington. We don't react to that. Well, first of all, you're not going to stop things from going into the grinder, right? I mean, because people want government to do things, right? Um, and I, I think um, uh, we do have a very heterogeneous society. We're not Norway, and I think it's very important to recognize that. So we have to deal with the United States as it is, right? So Congress is the ultimate in diversity and in the kind of heterogeneity you're talking about and in making it as bad as it can possibly be politically because you have 535 people pulling in 535 directions trying to get their things, right? Trying to make sure that if uh, a policy passes, it's got some provisions in there for them. Right, and so that you you can get get some cobbled together thing in the end that doesn't solve any problems. So that's the way heterogeneity works out in this institutional context. Now, do institutions matter? Yes, they do. So heterogeneity is one thing, but you can plop institutions down on that heterogeneity, and some institutions will do better than others. That's our point, right? So we think. An institution that has a fast track component will do a better job in a heterogeneous society than the one that we have now. My guest today has been Terry Moe. He is the author with William Howell of the book Relic. Terry, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. It's great. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.